you know, one of the issues with Christians in general has been that we struggle with assurance. Assurance is always something difficult because we don't feel, well, there's the number one problem. We go based off our feelings a lot of times, right? But we don't feel like we are, you know, worthy. We don't feel like we're up to it. We don't feel like we are good people. And really, I mean, if you're honest, you look at that. If you spend a lot of time looking at Jesus, probably you recognize you're not, you're not uh, there yet, right? You've not measured up. And, and, and when will you measure up? When will you achieve that, that, that final place? Right? And it's like, oh, man. And so you, there's always this, this, this back and forth with, with people about assurance. How do I have assurance? And so today we're going to be studying from the books of Leviticus and Haggai, two books that are never preached out of. And so uh, I wonder if you have your Bible, you'd like to turn me to Leviticus chapter 6. That's where we'll be going to first, Leviticus chapter 6. And we will learn about something called the Holy Flesh. And it is something that has led a few people to make some really weird decisions sometimes. Uh, but I want you to know it's a real thing, and it's how you're going to have assurance. Okay, ready? Here we are in Leviticus chapter 6. And we're starting in verse 25. God is tell, giving Moses some instructions. He says, Speak unto Aaron and to his sons, saying, This is the law of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest that offers it for sin shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be what? Holy because it's called the holy flesh. You with me? I want you to get the picture, okay? The sacrifice is made. And now, he go and they take that flesh. It's been burned up. They're actually supposed to eat part of it. They're supposed to eat it in the sanctuary because it's holy. And anything that touches it becomes holy. What does the sacrifice that was offered there represent? Come on, John chapter 1. John looks at Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. What does the sacrifice represent? It's Jesus. So if you're just looking at this and knowing that all these things were pointing forward to Jesus, and I asked you, well, what is the holy flesh? You would tell me, Jesus. Jesus is the holy flesh. And this is really the, the, the most basic we can get. If you want to be holy, what do you have to be touching? You need connection to Jesus because holiness does not come from any other place. In fact, uh, when the Bible instructs us and says, be holy even as I am holy, it, it almost you ought to just kind of like chuckle to yourself and say, well, th this is great because you're telling me that I have to be connected to you at all times. Hallelujah, right? Hallelujah, I get to be connected to Jesus. That's great. Now, there is another verse that's also very interesting that just helps us to understand a little bit more of this picture, and it's in Haggai chapter 2. Belma read it for us for our scripture reading. Haggai chapter 2, if you're looking for Haggai, you go to Matthew, and you back up three books, because nobody knows where to find any of the minor prophets, right? But if you go to, if you have a song, if you have a scripture song, then you know where to find it. So, Get, uh, get yourself a good scripture song so you can know where the minor prophets are. Matthew, back up three books, you get to Haggai. Haggai chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, read the following. Thus says the Lord of hosts, go and ask the priests concerning the law, saying, if one bears holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, I don't know why you'd carry something in your in your like robe anyway but whatever i did not ask him that okay this is this is, get the picture the guy the, the priest has the holy flesh and he puts it in the skirt of his garment he must have an undergarment too right but he's carrying it you're following right I just want you to see the picture i want you to don't you envision it imagine what that looks like and he says ask the priest if he's bearing the holy flesh in the skirt of his garment. What does that make his garment, by the way, according to Leviticus chapter 6? His garment is holy. Okay, now, if he touches with his skirt bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? 
And the priest answered and said, no. What's the only way you can be holy? Touch the holy flesh directly. Not a secondary connection, but a primary connection. You with me? Okay. And then he says, and the priest answered and said, no. Verse 13, then said Haggai, if one that's unclean by like touching a dead body touches any of those things, do they become unclean? And the priest says, yes. So you're getting the picture. You can make anything unclean if you're unclean, but can you make anything clean if you're clean? No, <laughs> it, is just, it is just so interesting. So let's say you are connected to Jesus Christ because Jesus is the holy flesh, right? And you want to help your neighbor to become holy. And so you go to your neighbor and you say, I have a list of things with which you can do in order to become holy. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to begin to keep the Sabbath. I want you to return tithe. I want you to now make a difference between clean and unclean meats. I want you to, and you, your list is it's pretty good. It's a good sized list. And they wanting to be holy say, absolutely. I consent to all these things. I'm doing them. From henceforth, are they holy? What? Why not? They're doing all the right stuff, right? You have to be connected to Jesus. You could think of this like a, you know, like, like when people play telephone, right? You know, the, the message always gets mixed up, just like the holiness gets lost through a, through a transitory vessel, right? Instead, we've got to, if you want somebody, your neighbor, to become holy, what do you really need to do? Lead them to Jesus, right? Because it turns out you can't do it. Only Jesus can do it. There's no such thing as a, as a secondary Christian. You maybe have heard somebody say, Jesus has no grandchildren. Only children, right? So if, so if maybe you've heard somebody say, you say, okay, so um, when, did, uh, when did you become a Christian? And somebody says, oh, well, I was, I was born in a Christian family. Are they a Christian? Not necessarily, right? Not necessarily. So when, when did you accept Jesus as your savior? Oh, I was born into a Christian family. Oh, I've always been a part of the church. Wait, wait that wasn't what I asked though. I said, when did you become connected to Jesus? And if there's not a, you know, I'm not looking for maybe a specific date, right? But if there's not some clear you know, idea in my mind, oh, I remember about that time I was really, you know, searching and I found, and I've been, yeah, nothing, I think it's been perfect ever since then, but I've been trying to be connected to Jesus. I want to be connected to Jesus. That's the key, connection to Jesus. That is what it is all about. That is how we are going to be holy. But the bad news, according to Haggai, was if you're not, if at any point you're not connected to Jesus, or if you ever are unclean, you can screw everything up, can't you, for somebody else, basically. You can really mess it up, and people do this a lot. You know, sometimes they get, they get some funny ideas in their head, and they say, they go to their, their neighbor, and they, maybe it's some kind of weird fanaticism or something like that, and they say, oh, here's what you need to do. Or they come into the church, and they say, oh, here's, look at all these things. This is what you need to do. That, you do that, and this will make you truly holy. You'll really then know God. But that turns out those external things are not what is going to bring holiness. Job in Job 14 says, who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? And he answers his own question. Not one. Nobody can. We just, we can't do it. In fact, the previous chapter in Leviticus, in chapter 5, basically goes through and tells us, even if you, you, you touch something and you're unclean and you don't know about it, you're still unclean and guilty. <laughs> oh. It says, when you become aware of it, then you need to go and offer a sacrifice because you're guilty. That idea, yes, Lucas. <laughs> and, you, and you become unclean because of the dead body. We're getting there. That's later on. Okay, so this is, this is really interesting because the, especially in the Old Testament, the ideas of clean and unclean were so prevalent. There were so many things that could, that could mess up the clean and unclean relationship. Some of the ideas, obviously, you know, have to do with health. Some of them have to do with other things, ceremonial. Basically, the idea was God was wanting them to realize 
that we live in a world of sin. We are constantly tainted by sin. And we need to, how, how often then should we be connected to the holy flesh? Always never give up the connection because literally the second you give up the connection, what's going to happen to you? You're, you're going to, the water runs downhill, right? You know, you know what I mean? That's me. My, my natural inclination is to go after those things that I practiced for 20 plus years, right? My natural inclination, I mean, forget about it. Children have a natural inclination to sin, don't they? There's lovely little children that are all up here. Parents, tell us the truth now. Tell us the truth. Their natural inclination is, to, is for selfishness. And so instead, God says, no, I want you to be connected to me. How, how often? Always. Always be connected to Jesus. So I guess the question that probably was on a lot of people's minds was, what about the Messiah? Is the Messiah allowed to be unclean? Because in the Old Testament, he was called the Holy One of Israel. And so can he be unclean? The answer, I think, is pretty clear. No, he's not going to be unclean. And so now we've got a couple of stories that can verify and help us to figure out what happens when we touch the holy flesh. Jesus, you with me? Okay, if you want to write down a verse, it's Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 19. I, Jen told me not to make a joke about this, so I'm not going to make a joke about this. It starts and it says, if a woman has an issue, but that's not funny. <laughs> If a woman has an issue, but it's not talking about that. It's talking about an issue in her flesh being blood, right? Basically, this is every month you understand women have menstruate. Yes, we're in a church. People, this is normal bodily processes. Yet in the Old Testament, it was very clear that, that menstruation made a woman unclean. And it could be health reasons. It could be other reasons. Leviticus chapter 15 actually talks about not just the bodily emanations of women but of also of men and they can all make everything makes everybody unclean <laughs> and so i mean like literally sexual intercourse makes somebody unclean all these things it's all there in the bible just get you want to read leviticus it's super fun it's really it's really all there and in leviticus chapter 15 it says that when a woman is having her monthly cycle she is supposed to go to the spa for seven days did you know that it says that? I mean, so it, pretty much. It says that she's supposed to go apart and chill for seven days. She's not allowed to cook meals for the family. She's not allowed to clean the house. She's not allowed to take care of the kids. None of that stuff. She just has to go and hang out with a bunch of other ladies who are also in the same kind of condition at that point and just hang out for seven days. Woo! You know what I mean? And so, we listen, we have... We have messed this up as a culture. There is still, Jen and I watched a documentary of this group. I think they're in Nepal. And in Nepal, they, they, they had this, this village where every month when the women would have their period, they went to this special like hut that they had prepared. And they, they sent them food. And this place was, it was pretty, pretty nice. And they would go and hang out there and just chat for a week. And they didn't, they, they, they didn't get to clean the house or get to take care of the kids or they didn't get to do anything. No cleaning, no, no washing, no, no going to work, no nothing. They just, they were forced to hang out and chill for a week. Now look, how, how many of you ladies, right, would like to just think, yeah, I'll just take a week off every month and just hang out. I have no responsibilities. Isn't God a wonderful, merciful God? What was that? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. The men did nothing while you were gone. It's all just been piling up. And we're like, finally, you're back, honey. Oh, no. Man, come on, man. You wouldn't do that, would you? You're responsible, upstanding Christians. You would make it so that it was a joy to come back. Oh, man, Sandra. I could to Jen totally would have said that. Um, anyway, so uh, I think I'm, it's a little bit, whoop, you turn me down a little bit. Um, yes, I know, man, the, even the, the system is excited about this idea, right? That, that this should be something that all women get to enjoy. 
we have messed it up. I'm so, I'll just apologize on behalf of our culture ladies that this is not current. See how much God loves you? It's really awesome. There's more ideas about that that probably are not as, as PC, what's shared there in Leviticus. You can go read it. It's really cool. Like God just re- absolves women of so many th- cool things. It's just like, it's good. Go read it sometime. It's awesome. So also I should just make mention that uh, this sort of uncleanness there was, uh, there is no sacrifice to be made for it. it it's not, it's not that kind of, un- there's, this is why we know that the ideas of clean and unclean sometimes have some different ideas in them. You with me? So this is not one where after this is done, then they have to go offer a sacrifice. That doesn't happen. However, however, it does mean that she is unclean for a time. And so if you're there in Mark chapter five, where I'm sending you, Mark chapter five, you will see a very interesting story taking place. In Mark chapter 5, Jairus has just come to get Jesus. He says, my daughter's very sick. Will you please come heal my daughter? And so Jesus says, yes, I'm going. He begins to walk on the way to Jairus' house. This is all in Mark chapter 5. And right around about verse 20, there's people all around him. All around him. They're surrounding him. They're pressing him. Everybody loves Jesus. And so they're all, they're all there. The spies, the people who love him, everybody, they're all there. And here's what it says. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood, 12 years, what is she in in this culture, this society? The word is unclean. She's unclean. A certain woman, which had an issue of blood for 12 years, and had suffered many things by many physicians. Sorry, Deanne. Sometimes that's just what it seems like doctors do, right? (laughs) Make people suffer. Or maybe the physical therapists do that too sometimes, make people suffer with their their knee bending and all that. And she'd spent all that she had, but she wasn't any better. She just grew worse. So get a picture for this lady here, okay? She had, she'd she'd been all over town seeking a cure. Who were the people who helped set up medical ideas at that time? It was the priests. The priests were the one who helped to, to give prescriptions and say, you need to do this and you need to do that, right? In order to become clean again. And so she had undoubtedly been all around town, all the priests, all the doctors, everybody knew that this woman had an issue of blood, and that means they knew that she was unclean. And the spies are all around Jesus. And here comes this woman. She, knowing that she's, I don't know, she's ashamed to ask him, whatever. She comes, and she just touches the hem of his garment. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus must be unclean, right? She touched him. Doesn't he become unclean? She's unclean. Anybody who touches her, Leviticus told us, becomes unclean. She touched him. Is he unclean? He is, he is what's, he, what's another name for, for Jesus Leviticus gave us? The holy flesh. He's the holy flesh. When anything touches the holy flesh, what does it become? Holy or clean. She touches him. Does she make him unclean? No, he makes her clean. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful idea what happens here. This idea as well is especially interesting because there were people all around him, pressing him, touching him. And so he says, hey, who touched me? And the disciples are like, Jesus, what? There's people all around you. And you say, you say, who touched you? He says, I felt power go out from me. Because there was, and then when he, when he actually addresses her, he says, it was your faith. Your faith has healed. So what was the touch that happened? When, when she touched the holy flesh, it was a touch of faith. Everybody else was touching the holy flesh, but it didn't, no power went out into their lives. She touches Jesus in faith, and what happens to her? She becomes clean. The only thing that can happen, happens. She touches the holy flesh, and she's changed. She's transformed. It's really an amazing idea. A lot of times, uh, we, we would like to think that we are, we, what we've done maybe is too big, too bad for Jesus, right? We can't come to him. In fact, I've heard people tell me this. I don't know if Jesus would accept me. I've done, I've done too much. But that is a misunderstanding of where we are at, right? Because maybe it's, it's not picturing how big of a sacrifice Jesus has made, how great he truly is, how much of the holy flesh he truly is, right? So, when somebody comes to him, no matter how big or bad your sins may have been, when you touch him in faith, which is how salvation comes to you, right? By grace through faith, 
Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, right? The idea is, I don't care what you've done. You touch him and what happens to you? That touch of faith appropriates power from God into your life, and you are clean. Isn't that what, what uh, Ash shared with us in the children's story, right? 1 John 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, which is coming to him and saying it was me, grabbing hold of him, right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to, to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that wonderful? So you, so you come to him, no matter your condition. You come to him. That's the only solution. Because if you stay away from him and say, okay, I've got to fix some other things first. I've got to do, let me, let me get some things right before I come to Jesus. Well, that's just working on the externals. Is that really fixing anything? It's not fixing a thing. You need to come to Jesus. So there is another story here that is another unclean incident. In Numbers chapter 19 and verse 11, it simply says, he who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. So that is not going to be a good thing. Don't, don't touch a dead body, right, Jesus? You'll become unclean. In fact, you could imagine in the press, right, somebody, some of the spies are watching, and they say, ah, oh, she touched him. You better go offer a sacrifice, Jesus. And he says, no, 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 no. I didn't become unclean. Look at her. She became clean. That's why he stops, and he, he, he watches. Then they go on to the house, and, and there's a dead girl there. And what does he do? He takes her by the hand. Uh-oh. He must be unclean, right? Oh, man. Instead, he takes her hand. He says, Talitha kume. Right? Little girl arise. And what happens? She is changed. The touch of Jesus is transformational. That's, that's what's going to happen. It's not that you're going to make Jesus unclean by coming to him. It's not that you're going to mess things up by coming to him. It's that he's going to transform you when you come to him. There's another story of him touching somebody who's dead and, and not becoming unclean. It was just much more public. You remember when he went and uh, in Matthew chapter, oh, no, it was in Luke chapter 7. He goes to uh, the widow of Nain's dead son, right? He's there. They're, they're bringing him out on, in the casket, and he goes up. He goes right up to it, and he touches it. You're not supposed to do that. Even the guys that were burying it would have had to be unclean. So he, he goes right up to it, though. You can just imagine the disciples like, what's he doing? Stop him, stop him. Oh, oh he's going to touch it. And then he does. Oh, man. But it doesn't make him unclean. What happens? The boy is resurrected. It's this amazing thing that's happening. You know, it, and this had been a, a really prevalent thing in their society. They had, you know, it was even a hidden grave if you touch it. And then you became aware of it. You'd have to go offer a sacrifice. Hidden graves were a problem too. Jesus actually had addressed this with the Pharisees. Do you remember what he said to them? He said to them in Matthew chapter 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but within are full of dead men's bones and all kinds of uncleanness. When you touch the Pharisees, what happened to you? You became unclean. And then he said, can you imagine him saying this to people? Oh my goodness, this is like fighting words. Luke chapter 11, verse 44, he said something similar where he said, you are like a whitewashed sepulcher full of dead men's bones. He, he's, he's accusing them of not having life within them because they have no vital connection to the Son. Yet he is there offering to cleanse them. In fact, in another place in Luke 5, 17, it says that the presence of the power of God was there to heal them, and in the context, it's the scribes and the Pharisees that he's able to heal. He wants to heal them because something's wrong with them inside, and they don't even know it hardly, but they're becoming aware of it. And when you become aware of it, then you're supposed to go and touch the holy flesh and become clean, but they don't want to do it. <laughs> and so he addresses them one more time, and he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. So, so look, unless you lead somebody to Jesus, you're really not helping them. 
you might as well just leave them alone. If your role, if your job is going to be to teach them only how to, you know, keep the Sabbath, how to return tithe, how to whatever, all, all those good things that are good that a transformed Christian may take a part of, right? But if that's all you're going to teach them but not lead them to Jesus, honestly, it might be better to just leave them alone. I know that's a, we that's a weird thing for a pastor to say, but that's because you're supposed to lead them to Jesus, right? That's our job as Christians. Lead people to Jesus. The very last story I will share with you is about the one thing in their culture that was worse than death. And it is found there in Leviticus chapter 13 and verse 45. Here's what it says. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent. He's supposed to tear his clothes, keep his head bare, and he shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, unclean, unclean. I thought when I was reading this, I thought that this was like maybe speaking against mustaches or something. And Jen was like, that's why. But you, no, you, that's, a in, inner, that's just in our house. If you have a mustache, God bless you. It's okay. I like it. But she doesn't. In addition, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It just when I read that this morning again, I was like, what is, what is that? What do they put on their upper lip? I don't know. I'm sure it must be like a mask, right? Right? They're supposed to wear that to make sure they don't infect other people. So whatever the case is, they're out there, and they're supposed to be crying out, unclean, unclean. And they're never allowed to come in and be with other people. So and for years, potentially until their death, as this disease slowly eats away at them, they are cut off from other people. They're unclean. And in Matthew chapter 8, we find this story. When Jesus was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, I, I want to I wanna read something from Desire of Ages it's about this, this uh, example here, it, just describing this man. It says, he's a loathsome spectacle. The disease has made frightful inroads, and his decaying body is horrible to look upon. At sight of him, the people fall back in terror. They crowd upon one another in their eagerness to escape from contact with him. Uh, leprosy in the Bible is often picture, a picture of sin. How do we treat people who we recognize have a, have a problem with sin? That, that would be the best way, right? Talitha said we lead them to God. That's the best way, right? oftentimes in our society, we recoil from such people. Oftentimes in Christianity, you know, you've heard the horror stories, right, from back in the day. It doesn't happen anymore, I hope. But, you know, somebody shows up at church and they don't look the part, and somebody says, you know what, maybe you'd better not come in today. And you're like, whoa, what? That happened? Did that really happen? And I'm assured by many in the older generation that it did happen. I don't think I've ever personally seen it happen. Hallelujah, right? But at the same time, can you imagine that happening? These people are all recoiling from this man. And it says some are even trying to prevent him from getting to Jesus. I can just imagine the disciples. No, no, you're not going to get there. All right, I'm getting out of the way. I can't let you touch me. <laughs> like they're just so eager to make sure that this doesn't happen. They're trying to prevent him. But he neither sees them nor hears them. And that's what we, if we recognize we have a sin problem, should do. Don't pay any attention to the noise, right? They, he, he neither sees them nor hears them. Their expressions of loathing are lost upon him. He sees only the Son of God. He hears only the voice that speaks life to the dying. And pressing toward Jesus, he casts himself at his feet and he cries, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus does not, not, what did he say in another place? All who come unto me, I will in no wise cast out. And so if you're ever feeling unclean, like a leper, full of sin, like, like wretched to other people, somebody else has scorned you, ridiculed you, where should you go? You go directly to Jesus. You fall on your face and you say, Jesus, make me clean. If you're willing, you can do it. And look at what Jesus does. I like to imagine, because it says he touched him, but I like to imagine that he because how do you, somebody's kneeling in front of you. What's the first thing that's next, next to you? It's your head. I like to imagine he put his hands on his face. 
And he drew him up and he said, I'm willing. But uh uh-oh, right? He touched him. Like, I mean, I get it. You touch, you know, somebody who has their period. Fine, okay, well, I'm a hook, right? You touch somebody who was, was dead. That's not so good, but I mean, still, they're not sick. They're already dead. Touch a leper? Jesus, don't do that. Jesus touches the leper. And the only thing that can happen, happens. The leper doesn't make him unclean. The leper is cleansed. I love it. It is such a beautiful picture of what it, what it means when we come to Jesus. When you put your hand on the holy flesh, on Jesus Christ, and you say, God, I, I confess, I am, I am a sinner. I, I, from my head to my toe, I need to be covered in the blood of Jesus. You understand, in the Old Testament, they actually did that with, uh, with Aaron when they were consecrating him. It was blood from the earlobe all the way down to the big toe because that's how much we need to be covered in the blood of Jesus, head to toe, because that's how unclean we are. You understand in the Bible, it tells us in Isaiah that even our righteousness is as filthy rags. And you know what the word is there? In the original, the translation, it's menstrual rags, right? A, a, our righteousness is like used feminine products. Our righteousness is, as the Bible would say, unclean. Our righteousness is unclean. Oh my goodness gracious. You have nothing to present to Jesus and say, Jesus, I'm, you, you, you have to save me. Look at what I've done. You have nothing. You have absolutely nothing. Yet, yet you come to him anyway because you have no other hope. What will you do otherwise? What can you do? Nothing. Yet he says, come. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. Come to Jesus. Lay your hands on him. He will cleanse you. That's the very best thing you can do. You want to know what the second best thing you can do is? Take somebody by the hand and say, I can't make you clean, but here, follow me. Follow me. Come over to Jesus. Lay your hands on him. Be connected to him. Friends, that's what Christianity is. Connection with Jesus and seeking to connect others with Jesus. That is literally it. Be connected to Jesus. That connection is transformative in itself. And then you go and you take somebody else because you love them, because Jesus loves them. You go and you want them to be connected too. Do you want to be connected to Jesus today? Come, do you want to touch the holy flesh? That you, you, you want to, like we need to pray and we need to tell him that, right? If, if, that is your, if you've been touched at all, you, want to, you say, God, I want to do that, and maybe I know somebody else. I want to bring them to Jesus too, and I'm thinking about them. Would you just stand? We're going to pray together. We're going to ask that God would do that in our lives because we can't do it ourselves. If that's your desire, I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing together as we're closing. So, Father in heaven, we just want to come before you right now and just say thank you again. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being so wonderful. We, Lord, are unclean from our head to our toe. We recognize it. Who can bring an, a clean thing out of us? Not one. Who can, make, who can make any change in us, Lord? Only you. Only you. And so we're coming to you, Lord. We are coming to you, and we're praying that you would please, Lord, no, I'm going to change my words. Father, you said all who come to you, you would in no wise cast out. You invited us. You said, come all you who are weary and heavy laden. Lord, we are coming. You know our hearts right now. We are coming. So instead, we're saying thank you. Thank you for being willing to receive us. Thank you for being the holy flesh that we we can touch, that will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you that you can give us your righteousness. Thank you for being such a wonderful God. We love you. You're great. Thank you for that. Father, if there's anybody else in our lives who's even remotely willing to come to you, would you please help us to know that? And give us boldness to just lead them to Jesus. I know that they'll be transformed. We, I, I know it, all that stuff's going to, you're going to help work that out. And they're going to come to love your word. And they're going to come to follow you. And all that's going to be great. But Lord, first, just help us to lead them to you. We thank you and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.